Hello everyone, good of you to turn up in such large numbers. Great to see you all here. My sister doesn't live in Thiruvannathapuram. She doesn't even live in India. She's visiting from California. But she has been publishing books in India, about 11 of them so far. And I'm just delighted to have this opportunity at the invitation of the Madhubhumi Festival of Letters to actually have a conversation with her about her writing and mine. So we'll ask each other questions and then we'll turn to you in case you have any questions for us. So the first thing to do, Shoba, you're a bit of a late bloomer as a writer. And therefore the question that comes up, when you were a little girl, did you ever think, you remember I used to write as a kid, did you ever think you might also want to be a writer? Oh dear. Hello, can you hear me? First of all, thank you so much. I know you've all come to see Shashi Tharoor, but I'm delighted that you're all here. Much better to see is her, I assure you. Uh, th this is, the topic is called home turf. So you're going to get something very different from my brother. It's not going to be just a conversation about politics and all of his 25 books. Um, he asked me a question, uh, you're a late bloomer. And I was thinking, I bloomed, but under his own shadow, his shadow growing up because I'm younger than he is. And you know, children fulfill parents' dreams. Once Shashi fulfilled everybody's dreams, there was no reason for me to do very much. But as you remember my brother, we played a lot of word games. We did a lot of writing. We did a lot of storytelling. We did poetry writing. So I was writing all the time, but not of the level that you were. And that's what happened then. But blooming late, you know, there is a lovely poem by the American poet, uh, Mary Oliver. And she says, what are you going to do with your one wild, crazy, wonderful life? And, and there is another poem in which there was a line that says, I do not wish to wither on the vine. And so I think that has been my mantra once I sent the kids off to college and beyond, is that I wanted to be able to do some of the things that I've always wanted to do. That's wonderful. And in fact, that's exactly it, because um, uh, she was an MA in English and so on, but chose to be a full-time mother. Uh, and then when the kids left, her creativity came out and, and, and the book started coming, as well as the voiceover narrations and movies. She actually has won a National Film Award for her voiceover uh, for a documentary on the reigns of Kerala. So the difference in many ways was that I started writing very young and I started writing and publishing when I was still a kid. So maybe in that sense, as you said, that there was no pressure on you to do anything because I was, I was doing it all. Exactly. And you know, women hold up half the sky, but most biographies are written by men and are, are about men. So it's, I, I decided to seize the world at a different stage. And I did work. I wasn't only raising the children, but that's, that's an, a very important creative task. Shobha did mention we played a lot of word games and that I think was a formative influence in our home. My father was a word game fanatic, our father. Uh, he... Uh, I don't know, did many people here play Scrabble? No fans? Oh, there are quite a few hands. There you are. All right. So, Dad um, discovered Scrabble in England. I was born there because he was working there for 10 years. And when he came back to India, uh, he wanted to maintain it. It was an unknown game at that time in India. But he managed to get a group of people together in Bombay to play Scrabble every weekend. And he kept it up. And when we were born and grew up, we were introduced to Scrabble very young. All the other word games, boggle and crosswords and so on. And when we ran out of possible games to play, dad would invent some for us. So one of his favorite things was he would uh, give us 10 letters and give us a certain number of hours while he was away at the office where we would have to come up with as many words as possible with those letters. And there would be one 10 letter word at least using all the letters. And then we needed to make smaller words of four letters or... Um, or more. I think for a brief, um, for a brief while, I think uh, uh, my sisters were given an opportunity to, um, to um, uh, have smaller, shorter words because they were younger. We played with Constantinople, my sister and I. <laughs> Do you remember Constantinople? Put it on a piece of paper. And then how many words can you make out of Constantinople in about five minutes? And then at one point, uh, for car journeys, Dad invented the forerunner of Wordle. So about 50 years before this happened, he invented a game 
which was very much like the wordle that we've all heard now. And that was uh, something which uh, he would imagine a five-letter word in his head and ask us all to uh, guess what the word was. But we had about 20 turns between us because unlike today's wordle 50 years later, there were no gray squares and green squares and yellow squares. We just had to guess using our heads. And it was, it was a fun thing. So anyway, so that obsession with words is very much part of the family. And perhaps that's what's shown up in both of our writing Exactly, lives. yeah. We, we loved words, and I, in my case, particularly loved the sound of words. Even today, when I write prose, I read the prose aloud, even if it's for children. And it's sort of, if it's asynchronous to my ears, then I edit it because the sound of words is so important. And it's really interesting to see my brother has a book coming out. You know, he writes these non-political books every once in a while, and you have a book coming out on words, uh, whereas I've signed a contract on a book called Use Your Words, and I had no idea he was doing one on words as well. So, you know, we seem to be sort of working in tandem <laughs> at a, perhaps at different levels for a different audience, but certainly words are very much an important part of our family law. You've written about uh, how to write poetry. One of her, my favorites of her books is a book called It's Time to Rhyme, which is about different forms of verse described in verse as a way of instructing people how to write those verses. Would you tell them about that? Absolutely, yeah. There is a book that I published in America called How Many Lines in a Limerick? And my brother was very fond of the book, so sort of he, I have to give credit to him that a lot of my own skills and ambitions have been fulfilled by that little nudge from Big Brother. When I was a child, and I'll tell you about the poetry book, but I thought you might want to hear some anecdotes about him as well. People always tell me, can you understand when he speaks? And I said, he speaks to be understood. So don't ask that question. It's not a fair question. He communicates effectively and well. And if you don't know the word, look it up like we used to do in school. In my generation, when we were growing up, if there were words we didn't know, we looked them up, right? So there's nothing wrong with that. But Shashi definitely does not speak to confuse. He speaks to communicate. But I remember when I was a child, um, I was describing somebody and I said, this person is very nice. And he said, can't you think of a better adjective or adverb to describe the person? And I will never forget it. I must have been 10 years old. So, you know, that kind of mark of excellence has always stimulated us to sort of do beyond. And that is the kind of philosophy I take with me when I go out to speak to children. And I've been speaking all over the country, in fact. So this particular book of poetry was published in America. It's called um, How Many Lines in a Limerick? It was a small publisher. And small publishers in America, or probably anywhere, don't really have the marketing budget and the sales budget to take the author around the country to do things. And Shashi very casually told me once, why don't you try to publish this in India? It's such an incredible book, which was high praise for me. And I was able to find a publisher here. It's a beautifully produced book that Touchwood won me an award, a publishing next award for ages eight and up. Um, but the book is unusual and interesting since he's given me this platform to describe it. Essentially, it's a book that has what we call poetry of the classroom versus poetry of the playground. So the book is introducing nine different poetic forms to children in the form of the poem, which is very, very unusual, as you said. Um, for instance, a sonnet in the, the first description that says a sonnet in iambic pentameter and I write it in 14 lines. It has an octave and a sestet. It ends with a couplet and it says a sonnet is an interesting poem. Its length is not a matter of your choice. Now, that is how you learn what is a sonnet. But to make it fun for people who read is that the example poem is a poem about a child throwing away the lunch that mother has packed. And it's, it's about eating junk food. So the story, the poems resonate with children because they read a poem that they enjoy and laugh aloud at, or it resonates with them because of the themes that are introduced. And then they realize, oh my gosh, this also has that da-dum, da-dum, the long and short syllable, the iambic pentameter beat, the couplet at the end. So they're writing a sonnet as well. And when we do workshops, we actually write some of these forms. So I introduce nine different forms, and then I have example poems to reinforce that. And that has really made the poetry book very exciting. And the second half of the book is a lot of um, what I say with the poem again is, we've, I've taught you some forms, I've taught, given you some words, now let's take all of that and create, write our own poems. And it's all written in poetry and then we write some poems.
all about the world and about the fact that we are all, all of us here, storytellers, communicators, we're all global citizens. Children are going to be the future leaders of tomorrow. They are the stewards of the planet and they're the ones who are going to learn the most. It's such a privilege to be able to write for children. Your latest book is about idioms. What, what is yeah. that about? The book on idioms is uh, called Look Before You Leap. I saw they have it in the, in the bookstore here. Um, you know, I have a, a, a three-book contract with uh, Westland, with Red Panda Books. And the first book was called A Treasure Trove of Timeless Tales. They wanted retelling of children's stories. So in that book, I wrote a few poems of my own, I mean, a few stories of my own. But I, my theme for that book was One World, Many Stories, Many Stories, One World. And we have stories from all over the world. And some of them are very familiar stories. So for instance, there's a story called Ison Boshi, from Japan, and the, and the story, if, I mean, as soon as I was doing my research and I read the story from Japan, I realized I've read something similar before when I was a child, Tom Thumb, which is English, Thumbelina, which is from Sweden. So si different parts of the world, we have similar stories. The same thing with our Panchatantra stories and Aesop's fables, you see the cross-reference. So the notion is that stories... The Panchatantra stories are older than Aesop's fables. Well, I know, and that's an argument. Some people, we in India would definitely like to believe that. That's true. I think the Greeks think... No, no, they we know they traveled from India to where the... Where the the, the, the Greeks picked but them up via Persia, I think, and, and the Arab world. But anyway, yeah. So Look Before You Leap is part two of that, and it's retellings again. But I didn't merely want to retell stories uh, that perhaps some of you have read and some of you have not from the Panchatantra and Aesop's fables. What I said I would do, and I told the publishers, let's look for the origin of idioms in some of these stories. So the famous story of the crow with the pitcher trying to get water from the pitcher. Do you remember that? So what is the idiom there? Everyone knows. The kids always put their hands up. It's necessity is the mother of invention. And similarly, there are many such stories from the Panchatantra and Aesop's fables that even if they did not deliberately or specifically or were the origin of idioms, they, you can stake those stories and extrapolate idioms from them. Um, so that's sort of fun because kids learn idioms as well from that book. Thank you. What's next? What's next? Oh, books of mine. I have an ecological story that I've just signed a contract that will come out this year in which we talk about one of our favorite trees in Kerala, the coconut tree. I'm using trees as, an, as a theme to tell children and, and all of us that there is something special in all of us. And the trees, so the banyan tree is a bit of a boastful tree and he's showing off about himself and coconut tree and people tree are feeling very insecure and sandalwood comes and tells them how special they are and enumerates their many qualities and talents. How do you know that a coconut tree, I believe if you plant in your garden, can fill, fulfill the needs of a family for five generations? Wow, so that's right. pretty incredible. And every part of the tree well, is Why you got somebody willing to climb up and get the coconuts exactly. down? That's <laughs> more of a challenge. Exactly. Um, I suppose this is the dialogue. I should be asking you some questions. Go ahead. Uh, I had a list actually prepared. Let me look at that. Um, well, one, one thing, and I don't need to look at the list here. I noticed, for instance, with your fiction books, that what makes them particularly unique in addition to the good extra the good narrative telling, the storytelling, is that you frame all your books very differently. And I find, and again, maybe I learned from you sort of without specifically learning from you uh, in a direct way, I frame all my narratives very differently. And I noticed that, you know, Riot is written in a particular style, almost like news briefs. We have show business that is a little bit like, you know, those screen takes in a, in a studio setting. And then, of course, you have the incredible political um, satire of the great Indian novel. So is framing the story as important to you as I find it is for me? Yeah, I think that the telling of the tale is as important as the tale itself. And for me, therefore, uh, I've also been struck by the, the not terribly original thought that the very word novel means new. And therefore, if you write a novel, you should really be writing something new each time. So each of my three novels actually is a different kind of experiment in narrative form. With the great Indian novel, you have Ved Vyas dictating his Mahabharata of the 20th century, 
to a South Indian secretary called Ganapati. Now, what you've got here is Ved Vyas is a cantankerous old politician in his dotage, in his anecdotage, who is rec recalling the stories uh, of the 20th century that led to that present moment when he's dictating it. And of course, um, as we know, the, the Mahabharata itself is supposed to have been dictated by Ved Vyas to our elephant-headed god, Ganesh, Goganapati. And therefore, the same conceit is there. And like the Mahabharata, it is a tale that is told, in this case, by Ved Vyas. So increasingly, you find there are things he's telling you that he was a participant or observer of, and things that he's telling you that he couldn't possibly have known. But that's how the story evolves. And, and again, in the telling of the novel, I threw in many of the features of the classic Mahabharata itself, digressions into philosophy, into ethics, into ideas. Uh, and because the Mahabharata is actually not prose, it is a poem, the longest epic, epic poem in the world, five times the length of the Bible. I decided that I needed to carry something to convey the poetic quality of the original. And so I occasionally broke into verse uh, in the course of the novel as well, in order usually to manage transitions uh, more effectively from one kind of scene to another, uh, particularly in the desire to write satire on a subject that many people take very seriously, that satire had to be done in a way that was relatively light uh, and, and light to the touch, and that's why I chose that. My second novel, on the other hand, Show Business, consists of an actor lying on his hospital bed in a coma while sort of the story of his life plays out in his mind while he's unable to speak. And so what I've, I've divided it into six takes, oh. and each take consists of three parts. One part is the actor lying in his bed recalling his life. The second is the treatment, the storyline, complete with crazy lyrics of the Bollywood movie in which he's acting at that particular phase of his life. And the third is a monologue addressed to him by a key personality from his life. His wife, his father, his brother, uh, whom he, whose political ambitions he usurps by becoming a politician himself. Um, the villain of the movies who actually ends up uh, killing him and so on. So you've got a completely different, I'd like to think completely original, narrative structure through which the story unfolds. And then in my third novel, Riot, as Shobha mentioned, I have 13 different narrative voices to describe this particular riot, which is based on the notes I had from my IAS officer friend, Harshmanda, who was an IAS officer in Madhya Pradesh when a riot took place in his, in his area during the so-called Ram Sheila Pujan of 1989 in the lead up to the destruction of the Babri Masjid. And therefore, I actually had the anatomy of the riot from his own real notes, and um, as I, which I've acknowledged in the book. But I reconstructed it with fictional characters and each of them speaking in their own voice. So at least in English, I don't know how well it's worked in all the translations. But in any case, in, in English, um, each voice is supposed to sound distinct and different. Whether it is the Hindu chauvinist uh, politician, whether it's this sort of slightly... Uh, over sophisticated Muslim historian, whether it's this uh, IAS officer who's come from a college background very much like mine in St. Stephen's, uh, whether it's the, the tough talking, cursing Punjabi Sikh IPS officer who's the chief cop of the district. Each of these characters has a distinct voice of their own. And again, the narrative unfolds through these different perspectives until the reader gets a complete picture, or as complete as the reader wants to make it, of what actually happened. So each of these things is a different way of telling the story. And my hope is that because I write to provoke thought in the reader, I want you all to think. In that process, what I want my, uh, my, my, the, the way I tell the story to do is also to engage the reader in the process of the creation of the story in their own minds. So the value of framing a story, for those of you who may be writers in the audience, is as important as the story itself. And even as a children's writer, how we tell the story is so important. For instance, Prince with a Paintbrush, the story of Raja Ravi Varma, which was one of the first books I published in India in 2021. It's 
I'm very proud of it because it's not just an illustrated uh, um, biography that goes from, you know, when he was born and what he did and where he painted and all of that, because children may not be as interested in that kind of detail, though my goal was to get them to be as familiar with Galaxy of Musicians or Jatai Ubad or any of Ravi Varma's paintings as much as they are with Mona Lisa and, uh, you know, uh, other, other paintings from the Western canon that they're all very familiar with. So I framed the story from the perspective of a child learning about the poet, I mean, about the painter. You can't hear me? Sorry. Um, I, I frame the story in such a way that the child is discovering about the painter, and then we have comic bubbles where the child's thoughts are in, are in the book. That makes the story that much more appealing, and it, again, that's the reason why that book also won an award. It's because kids find the book interesting, you know, a biography written like that. So at right. every you, stage, you've experimented with a number of different absolutely. styles as well in I your books. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, I, at some point, we'd like to get, get you all involved into the conversation. But what I'd like to ask uh, audience readers in particular is when you read, what do you look for? Now, in my case, I've written both fiction and non. And with nonfiction, obviously, uh, there's a specific story you want to tell, which is usually historically based, or there's an argument you want to advance. So you're anchored into reality, whereas with fiction, you have all the freedom to innovate and come up with things. Now, you've written fiction stories which were you were not totally your own, right? You, you retold so I have, some Timeless Tales. Well, in Timeless Tales, I have my own stories as well, even though there are some retellings. Uh, in, in Look Before You Leap, it's there are entirely retellings, but framed again from a perspective of searching for idioms in all of them. But most of my other books, obviously, were written entirely by me. What's interesting is I also write poetry, so I have... I have a, a picture book that's entirely in verse, and it's here in the bookstore as well. I was very pleased to find it. Parvati. Parvati, the elephant's very important day, and it's a story of a, an elephant in the temple. But what, as you know, I was listening to another panel from some writers today, and they said we as writers have the prerogative to write whatever we want. We don't need to be told what we need to write. And similarly, I have Parvati carrying the Tidamba, whereas in Kerala tradition, usually the tuskers, the male elephants, carry it. And so sometimes people, children, or even adults will say, well, how come we have a female elephant carrying it? I said, well, cannot, can't a female elephant carry an elephant? Uh, the deity as well as any other elephant, of course they can. And women can do anything. So stories are not, especially for children, I'd like to say, and I, I, I'm sure it's the same for adult books, but an adult novel, once you've solved the mystery or you've read the story, you put it away in your bookshelf and very rarely do you go back and read it. Whereas with children's books, one of the greatest things and the gift that we have as writers of children's stories is that the stories are a springboard for discovery and discussion at every stage. So when you begin to write, you know, if it's a picture book like Parvati, in the beginning, a parent is reading or a teacher is reading to a little child who doesn't know how to read. They're following along with the photographs or the pictures or the drawings or the illustrations. But at a later stage, the child will remember some of the words. Later on, the child is older, is reading to him or herself and then further still they're looking up they're looking up what is an elephant what are these traditions they've learned new words I have nine Malayalam words in that book for instance so children reading all over the country are learning a new language at least a few words in a language because the incredible pageantry of our elephant tradition here is so incredible even I didn't know the names of some things you know uh, I mean, Panjavadyam, we know, we described the, el the, uh, the orchestra, but words like... Some animal uh, lovers may not be totally happy with your celebrating a captive elephant. So I have talked about that as well. You're absolutely right. That's a good point. You have to... The reality is there are, there are animals in captivity, but by anthropomorphizing the elephant so that children can identify with it, they are the ones who are going to be stewards of elephants and other animals in the future. We're giving a chance for children to recognize that an elephant like Parvati is excited, is sad, is tired, just like they are. And therefore, you feel that connection with the animals. And those are ways in which to introduce children to understanding their responsibility towards the planet, towards the animal kingdom, towards each other. Yes, that's the answer. You want to ask me something? Oh, ask you something. Yes, of course I do. Well, you know, I was going to ask you, when, when my brother was young, we used to play a game where we sat in a circle and we told each other stories. 
we always wanted the, you know, it was like musical chairs. When the music ends, you stop at a chair. So this way, it wasn't that way. I think we set the timer for a minute or two. So somebody would start the story. They would stop in a minute, and then the next person has to continue. We always wanted it to stop with him because his storytelling prowess was much better than ours. And he's, you know, he's older as well. He had a head start, but he's superb. So what was exciting is he used to make up plays. He used to do all of that. So one of my questions, this is of interest to me as well, is you've worked with different forms. He wrote an incredible poem that he shared with the family to his grandson yesterday who turned six. And I was telling him, I said, this is such an amazing poem. You don't have to recite it for anybody, but it's a beautiful poem that captures the spark of the six-year-old that's written with superb rhyme that is in, you know, engaging for a child since I'm working in that space. I was so excited. So my question to you is, are you at all tempted to do rather than your political books, as well as your non-fiction, as well as the fiction that you used to do, do you want to write a play, or do you ever feel you want to write a book of poems? Well, I did write a play. In fact, you, you may remember when you were kids, I wrote a couple of one-act plays that were performed in Calcutta in class, by, yeah. by family and friends, and one of which continued to have a life because uh, one of you girls, I think our younger sister Smitha, took it to school and did, a, did it in Loreto, and then... That became the Loretto entry in an inter-school play competition, so she took wow, it away. Maybe. So I, I, my play has gone around. I did write a play that was published as well in the Indian edition of my $5 Smile and Other Stories, which is a collection of stories. At the end, but only in the Indian edition, there is a play uh, called, I think, um, 22 Months in the Life of a Dog, which was based on a very well-known Russian play, um, in which essentially I took the metaphor of that story and applied it to the emergency. It was written very shortly after the emergency of 75 to 77. And the conceit of the play was that um, a dog's heart is, is, is transplanted into a man and, 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 uh, uh, and how the man behaves and how the man eventually starts metaphorizing into a dog. Um, it, it, it's a, a very, very sort of elaborate satire on all that went wrong during the emergency, coupled with Akashwani news broadcasts in the background and so on. To the best of my knowledge, I thought no one had ever performed it. It was just published and read, and some people liked it, some didn't. But later I discovered from the editor of the Hindustan Times, no less, that when he was a student in Chennai somewhere, really? he and his classmates had performed it in their college. So Without any permission to, from me, I might add. We but need that's to see right. another play I mean, from least, you. So it can be performed. So that's my playwriting experience so far. But don't I'm you want sure to I'm see another... Hurry. We want to see another play from you. I think it'll be good. <laughs> Shashi used to act as well when he was young in school. School plays. We all did, right? Yeah. See, that was a time when everybody had an opportunity. I mean, most of our entertainment was theater, was words, was music, was poetry. We went to the library every week, brought home books, read them and returned them. We didn't have all these competing distractions that we have today. Well, I mean, that's true. I mean, everyone, I don't know. I hope all of you are readers. You must be or you wouldn't be at a literary festival. But the fact is that uh, increasingly the challenge is the number of alternative ways you can spend your time has increased exponentially. Uh, certainly when I was young and I was an asthmatic child and confined to bed, the only source of escape, of edification, and of entertainment was reading. Yeah. There was no TV in my boyhood. There was no uh, computer, laptop, uh, mobile phone, a Nintendo, PlayStation. None of these existed. So what do you do when you're home and not well? you read? And in many ways, I think that that was the making of me. Um, I'm proud that my, my twin sons managed to maintain an interest in reading, and I've never seen them even catch a flight without a book. But increasingly, they themselves admit they come back home at the end of a long day's work. It is often more tempting and much easier to put your feet up and watch a movie on Netflix than to take the intellectual trouble of engaging with a book. And that's something that I worry very much about the next generation. I have many young friends in India whose children think of books as only schoolwork and homework, who don't seem to have any sense that a book can be a source of pleasure, can be a source of diversion, can transport them to other worlds and lives. That's not there. A book is for homework and schoolwork, and once it's done, you go out and play or you do something on a screen. I think that's terribly impoverishing. 
I would agree with you, but as a children's writer who's going around the country meeting children, I'm feeling quite, quite encouraged, at least at the younger grades, that children do enjoy a good book. And sometimes it's a matter of sort of giving them the kind of thing that they want to read. I always say there's no such thing as I don't like to read or there isn't a good book. They probably haven't discovered the right book. But it is true that the impetus is on all of us, the imperative is on children's writers to come up with things that are a little bit more interesting so that children feel, you know, put in the comic bubbles in your book, allow children to read graphic novels. It's fine to read a comic book if, you're, if that's how you're starting out. They all live sort of alongside each other. Absolutely. Shall we open it up to the audience? Do you all have questions or comments? And is there a mic going young? Not yet. Oh, you have a question? Sure. And we, we can continue our conversation if your question can... sparks something off in us. But there's a gentleman coming with a mic. So just wait for it to come and tell us what's in your mind. Good evening and every regular things. First question to Madam. Madam, uh, what are your plans uh, for the future to control him to get settled near your house or with you? What are my plans <laughs> to control my brother? Yeah. To do what? To settle? To be with you and your family and oh. you get to talk to him at once. At, there was some in a while. This sounds like somebody who doesn't want me to continue in politics, is that <laughs> Next, we'll come to you, sir. You know, I'll tell you something. Since my mother moved in with my brother four years ago, um, because of the pandemic is how it started, uh, she was living independently on her own till her early 80s. She had renewed her li driver's license at the age of 82. I've written a book about her. It's called Good Innings, The Extraordinary Ordinary Story of Lily Tharoor, um, Life of Lily Tharoor, and it's here in the bookshelf. And it's also been translated by Madhra Bhumi into a book called Dhanya Me Jeevan. And it's a very, very beautiful book. It's a short book. I hope all of you will read it because it's a tribute to women and mothers everywhere. It's not just a story of Lily. But what I was going to say is before that, my mother was living on her own in Kochi. Her flat is still there, locked up with all her things in it. But she came um, in uh, January of uh, 2020. She was back in my brother's home. Before that, she used to come for a holiday and leave. But in March, when it was time for her to go back, Kerala had the highest uh, cases of uh, COVID. And my brother tore up her ticket and said, you can't go. And then she continued to stay with him. And so most of my visits to India are only to his house because I come to see my mother and I get to see him. So when you say, what can I do? I worked on his campaign twice. So that's a way to be close to him. I, uh, he actually, he's incredible. He is probably one of the most responsive people I know for a man who works 20 hours out of 24. And we are now telling him, you don't need to respond to every message you get. You need to take rest. You need to get enough sleep. You need to take care of yourself because as far as I'm concerned, now that you're already in this world, everybody needs you, so you need to take care of your health. So I'm not trying to keep him near me so I have more access to him, but I want him to, to keep, I want him to take care of himself. And we have access to him in that sense, to be able to remind him of that on a daily basis. Thank you, ma'am. Shall I go to him? I think there's a hand behind you. Yeah, yeah I'll just ask you a question and leave. Sir, uh, I am going to ask you, are you going to help us to learn these bigger words? Normally, Homo sapiens doesn't use uh, those such a longer words and containing so many meanings in single word. And uh, can you think of teaching us online or something? No, I'm, I actually have written, I mean, there are already two, uh, there was one book out and one coming about words. Uh, one is called Tharurosaurus. Okay. It's uh, actually, I got that book. I just yeah, bought that book. It's now. just a selection of words yeah. and the stories behind them and how they are to be used. And uh, that's more of a joke, really, in some ways, because not everybody needs to use all those words. However, the new book that's coming out in a few months' time is called Shashi Tharoor's Wonderland of Words. Okay. And that uh, is a little more elaborate. It's based on essays I've been writing in a weekly column in the Khalij Times of Dubai. And it's a collection of essays on various aspects of language. Sometimes, yes, about words and their origins and the use it, but sometimes other kinds of stories about language and words, about the origins of the expression OK, or the, the uh, nature of certain idioms. And why do we say, you know, he's turning a blind eye to something? Uh, people don't realize it's because 
it goes back to the days of Nelson. when uh, exactly Nelson. Lord Nelson, who was a naval commander and he was engaged in the battle of, uh, of Copenhagen and he had to get Urlain. his Urlain. orders Urlain. from his admiral Urlain. through Urlain. flags. In those days, all naval orders were communicated by flags. And the chief admiral decided to withdraw at a time when Nelson thought the battle could still be won. So he didn't want to follow that order. Therefore, he held his telescope to his blind eye. You all know that Nelson had one eye, one arm and one leg by then because of various war injuries. Exactly. So he held his tele tele telescope to his blind eye so he could truthfully say he didn't see the order. And he continued and he won the battle. And there you are, it's turning a blind eye to something. I mean, all the sort of stuff. So the essays that trace some of these stories that talk about um, uh, origins of expressions, that talk about British usage versus American usage, that talk about Indian words in English, all sorts of things like that. So I hope that people who are curious about language will enjoy it. There really is Thank somebody you, behind you looking for the mic. So one fair. more sentence. I am your neighbor in Mundarath House from Elevenjiri. I am from Palashana. I'll meet you later. Thank you. Great. All the best. Thank you. Blind Eyes in my idiom book as well. Oh, really? Oh, my God. And I hadn't read yours yet. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, so, like, I'm a writer. Wonderful. And, like, I think that most writers and the work are, like, attached to him. So, we cannot actually push the writer and the work away. And it reflects a lot of emotions, politics, your beliefs, etc. So, recently we have seen that in the creative writing sphere, the most of the writers are suffering from mental health issues because of, or maybe they are reflecting on the works they have written. So have you both written some work that made you question yourself and your works? Like has that affected profoundly on your beliefs and emotions? Well, first of all, I think on this question of, uh, I mean, I, I would argue that you should judge the work and not the author because very often, the work is an independent work of creation that stands distinct from the author. And the author's life should not be a prism through which you see the work. That's my honest view because if the, if the, it's like producing a child. Once the child is born, you cease to have total authorship over the child. The child has to go out and find his or her own way in the world and be an independent personality. And similarly, once the book is born, the book has to stand by itself and be judged for itself. It need not be judged in relation to the author. That's, that's my personal view. That yes, authors can be nasty, despicable people and write great books. And vice versa. And you can't extenuate a bad book because the author is a nice guy or girl. And you can't at the same time, I think, um, judge uh, uh, a, a wonderful book badly because the author has unattractive traits. So separate the book and the author. That's the first thing. Secondly, for myself, I put a lot of myself into my books. And therefore, I um, uh, would stand by each one. I, one of the questions I have most difficulty with in literary gatherings, if somebody says, which is your favorite book? Or I haven't read anything by you. Which one should I start with? Which is your favorite? It's really like asking a parent, which is your favorite child? You just can't do that. Uh, each child is a product of your, of, your, of, your, of your love and your heart and your feelings. And similarly, each book has come out of whatever the best of yourself you could put into it at that time that you wrote it. And, and to my mind, therefore, uh, I would not say there's anything that I wrote that was untrue to myself. They were books researching which opened my eyes to a lot of things. I thoroughly enjoyed the research for the Ambedkar biography because like many Indians, I had a superficial knowledge of the life of Ambedkar, but not at all in the kind of detail that I uncovered and tried to summarize in the short biography of all that he had gone through and all that he had to overcome to get to where he got to. And it's, it was fascinating in that. So you learn something that way. Even in my colonialism book, An Era of Darkness, I had written, I mean, I'd made a speech on colonialism on the basis of what I already knew from my study of history and no doubt I'd written essays on aspects of it. But researching to put together a coherent book meant delving into some issues in far more detail than I might have done had I just not bothered to write the book and thought I was content with what I knew. So knowledge expands in the process of writing, but in my case anyway, nothing that I wrote has made me question myself at all profoundly. What about you? 
Um, yeah, I would agree. And, and what my brother said, just to add to that, once you write a book, it's what the reader brings to the book that in a sense is its own takeaway. And children, adults, different people bring in new perspectives. Uh, the book is no longer yours once it's out in the world in some ways. Um, as far as learning, I mean, when we are writing any book, we're always learning. I discovered new poetic forms that I hadn't learned in school because I wanted to make sure that I had a mix of simple poetic forms and complicated poetic forms. So, for instance, I'd never written a villanelle, even though, of course, I've read, you know, Dylan Thomas's and others' uh, villanelles in school. I didn't know that it was called a villanelle until I sort of looked it up. Tell and then everybody I what a villanelle is. So, a villanelle is a very particular 19-line poem that follows a very specific rhyme scheme and uh, I, I can't I don't I can't recite one you know by heart at the moment but it's very very particular and so I had to write a poem I wrote about a child and a skipping rope but I wrote it in the form of a villanelle and that was a challenging exercise for me and a, and a good deal of fun um, it's the same thing when I'm you know when you're re researching about Ravi Varma even though mine was not a historical or a scholarly book obviously when it's non-fiction and you're writing about somebody's life you do need to do the research to make sure that the information you share is, is honest. I didn't know, for instance, that some of Ravi Varma's paintings, his landscapes that were commissioned, he was commissioned to do about 14 poems when he was in uh, with uh, uh, the Baroda uh, king. He, he took his sister and his brother with him, or he made them do the art of all the backgrounds were done by his brother and his sister, and he only did the foreground in order to finish it in the short period of time he had to do it. In the short period of time he had to do it. So, you know, you learn a lot of stuff. Now, do I have any regrets? Not really. Um, I, I always wish that I had started this writing process many years ago. Uh, it's never too late, though, as I, as I told my brother. There's no such thing as as it's too late to write. There are many writers who didn't start writing until later in life. I used to write. I wrote columns in school, in college. Uh, I was in the, new, you know, in the magazine in college. I've, I've been writing for a long time, but published children's books definitely didn't happen until about 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, Hi. My name is Nanda, and I'm from Aizar Thirinandapuram. So there are two reasons why I'm asking both of you questions. One, Definitely, it's, it's a problem that has been pestering me for quite some time. And second, I can actually go tell my mom that I've asked you a question. So, Couldn't all right. No, it, the it, sounds it, didn't travel that well. Oh, yeah. Can you repeat that? Yeah. First, so, first is, it has been pestering me for quite some time, uh, the problem that I have. And the second one, I can go tell my mom that I could actually talk with you. So, <laughs> so, so the that's not a question, right? No, it's a no, statement. No. Yeah, I have a question. So the question is, uh, I've tried writing a book. So it was like I, I wrote 46 pages or something. Wow. And then I lost interest in my own writing. <laughs> and then I stopped writing altogether. So usually when I write short stories, I'm quite proud of it. And I'll read it and I'll enjoy it. And I'll read it for my friends as well. But when I tried writing a novel, it was a completely different scenario. I did not enjoy anything that I wrote, even though my friends said that it was good. And I couldn't continue it because of the friction. So is it, and, and now I feel like, okay, I would not be able to write another one because of this that I faced one year back. It was last August. So my question is, is it quite normal to feel like that, to not able to continue forward, even though you have a proper plot with you? I mean, I, I have the entire plot written down, but I'm not able to elaborate it. Is it quite normal or is yes. it just a... Yes, it's quite normal, don't worry about it. Uh, but let me say a couple of things on that. First, it's possible that your natural form is the short story right. and that maybe that's what you should do because you've done that before and you can do it well. It's also possible that um, you lost motivation halfway through even though you had a plot and a story outline in your mind. And the best way to find out, frankly, is by showing those pages, those 46 pages, to somebody whose judgment you trust and right. see if they will like it enough to tell you, God, you must continue. I had a similar experience. When I was writing the Great Indian novel, I wrote the first 32 pages, had fun, put it aside and didn't get to it. And I remember I was, because I was already working full time at the United Nations and I didn't have a lot of spare time for writing. And I would often uh, write columns in Indian magazines and newspapers also. So, I had deadlines to meet. 
So I was sitting at my computer one day, writing a column or whatever. This, this 32 pages printed out was sitting on a table behind me. And my brother-in-law who was visiting came and sat there and he started reading. And I saw him out of the corner of my eye. And then when he got to page 32, he kept turning, looking for more. And then he turned to me and said, where's the rest of this? And I said, there isn't any. I haven't written anymore. And he said, it's fantastic. You've got to write it. You've got to continue. Put everything aside. This is fabulous. And that kind of thing gave me a tremendous motivation and Philip to want to continue. So get someone to read your 46 pages. If they tell you, yeah, I can understand why you stopped. It's not worth continuing. Then you've got your answer from a feedback, provided it's somebody with good judgment whom you trust. But if they tell you it's fabulous, you must continue, you might well find the motivation to want to do so as well. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I don't have much to add to that. Other than if you put it away in a drawer like I do with some of the things I write, go back to it six months later and read it again. You might find that you've got a new idea or there's a character you want to put in or something exciting. Secondly, if you really like short stories, there's nothing wrong in writing short stories. That's that's superb. I also know novelists, which was an interesting thing because I keep telling everyone, I can write short stories. I don't know if I can write a novel, you know, when I'm talking about writing for adults. And they say that they very often write their novels like short stories. So they write specific standalone stories and then weave them all together. That's a clever way to approach a novel writing as well. Yep. Two short questions. One, yes, and then uh, we come to Sunita's book. <laughs> Uh, writing Who's got is the mic? in the Sorry. family, ah, so does your younger sister also write? And second, Dr. Tharoor, you said about writing plays. Have you thought about writing for a movie? <laughs> My younger sister, we are both encouraging her to write, but no, she so far hasn't uh, published anything. Is that his question, her question? Her first question she... was about our younger sister, oh, that she also writes. And the second question is whether I would write for a movie. Uh, I haven't yet tried, and I'm not sure that I, it's naturally a medium. You know, some people think in images, I think in words, and therefore I'm not necessarily going to be able to visualize something when I can describe it so much better. Uh, one, of my, um, uh, one of my novels was made into a rather bad movie, and that's the book Show Business, which was made into a movie called Bollywood, now 30 years ago. Uh, and I saw the screenplay, and uh, it looked better on paper, shall we say, than when it came out on the screen. Uh, another one of mine... Um, the Riot. Riot. Somebody has written a script, uh, and, and it hasn't been produced in the present climate. There's always worries about whether you can shoot a film like that right. in today's India. Uh, but nonetheless, I've seen the script. Uh, she hadn't finished the entire book, but the two-thirds that she had done was very, very good and unfortunately very faithful to my original. And the problem with a writer converting his writing into a screenplay is also going to be that. Um, somebody said that if a novel is taken and made into a, a, a full-fledged screenplay, everything in the novel is preserved, most novels will be 18-hour movies and no one is going to watch it. So you need to have enough detachment from the novel to be able to ruthlessly excise things and create a filmable sufficiently short, viewable thing that captures the essence. That is in many ways a different art. So my own view is when people acquire the rights to my stories, or my, and one of my short stories also, by the way, somebody has written a script for what I hope will be a Malayalam movie, uh, I will say that um, once you've surrendered it, you have to leave it, you have to recognize it is a different art form. And you can no longer exercise that sort of possessive control of your creation. The story or the book is mine, the film is his or hers, and they will, they will essentially be accountable for what they've made of it. This is a very short question, which I want to ask both of you. Um, I personally think, and uh, do you agree or disagree, I think that the writing of fiction requires more creativity than writing nonfiction. No, there's no doubt about that because you have to imagine another world and bring it to life. Mm. So there has to be, has to be creative. And, and the writing is also much more demanding, Sunita, because you not only have to uh, uh, create this world, you have to inhabit it day after day in a way that all the episodes, characters, lines of dialogue, incidents in the fiction are as real to you as those you're encountering in your everyday life, which is one of the reasons I've stopped writing fiction as my work responsibilities have become so much more demanding 
it was impossible to sustain that illusion in my head, this alternative moral universe you have to create, um, when, when it's so constantly being interrupted by real life. Uh, that's why I think writers of fiction need to be able to cut themselves off from everybody else for at least some hours every day to inhabit this world. It's like this glass palace you're building where you, you can enter and see all these different people. But if every time you're trying to write, something comes and interrupts it, whether it's a constituent with a petition or whether it's a, a political obligation, there'll be cracks developing in the glass. And after a big while, let's say you go off on a three-week election campaign, that entire glass edifice will shatter. <laughs> so my own laptop is littered with uh, attempts at half-begun novels. I knew where I wanted to go roughly, but I never had the, the time to sustain the illusion. That's one of the reasons why I decided to stick to nonfiction. It is partially because it's easier. It's also partially because it's more interruptible. You can, inter you can begin a piece of nonfiction, be interrupted even for days or weeks, come back to it, reread what you've written, and realize what your train of thought and argument was and pick it up and continue. You can't do that so easily with fiction. Do you want to answer that too? Um, and what specifically were you asking me? That you had, whether I agree that it's more difficult? So, so for instance, you know, I guess writing poetry and writing specific poetic forms is like non-fiction because there's a structure, there's a rhythm, there's something you need to adhere to. But the creative, what we call the poetry of the playground, which is what I added to every poet, poem of the school, schoolroom is was a little bit easier or rather it was a little bit more challenging to write in some ways because it's even though it fall, forms i mean it follows a particular form it was still something that i had to come up with for my imagination that i'm hoping children will enjoy so yes you're probably right that fiction is a little bit harder to do yeah sure so thank you thank you so much to both of you